module. We have a what new section in Power BI, so presenting the latest and greatest. There are quite a few updates uh, uh, that has been announced the last few weeks. And then I go and cover the fabric capacity metrics app. Uh, very important, especially for those who are using the fabric capacity or the premium capacity to see and to understand the report that is behind and how the utilization is. As usual, if you have any kind of questions, feel free to just interrupt, drop them in the chat, raise your hand, whatever suits you best. Dennis will have a look at the chat, I hope. He's nodding, that's good. Um, uh, because yes. Great. Perfect. So let's start with the what's new section. And I mentioned it last time already. We have the SQL bits coming in in a few days, happening from the 19th until the 23rd March in the UK. If you wish to sign up, uh, I think you can still do it. It's not closed if I'm not wrong. And you have a, a, a code that you can use to get a 5% discount. And I know that Dennis is presenting over there. So Dennis, probably you wish to say a word or two what you're going to present. Uh, my session will be on Saturday, the first slot in the morning. Saturday is free, by the way. So if you only come for one day, it should be Saturday, totally free of charge. And I will present about the data activator in Fabric. And it's in room, or as we call it at SQL bits, gate number 11, because this yeah. is a theme is uh, aviation. Nice. Thanks very much. Are you sure you want to present in Saturday morning, first session? Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure if I want, but that's how it is. <laughs> OK, OK, good luck. <laughs> All right, going with the next one. After that, we have the uh, Microsoft Fabric Community Conference happening in Vegas from 24 to 28 March here as well. If you wish, you can attend using the Fabric Community code. You will get a $100 uh, discount on that as well. And for those who are interested in certifications, as mentioned a lot of time as well, we have the DP600 now. It's in beta, meaning you can take it, but you will not get an immediate result until it's, let's call it general available. It should happen soon, um, as far as I know. So feel free to go out um, take it and wait for the result at the end to see if you pass it. I did it already, waiting still for my result. And let's see if I will pass. Then we announced a new Fabric Career Hub. Um, from my point of view, it's really great because you will find everything Fabric related if you're interested in this topic, meaning you can go in, find uh, learning materials. Uh, we offer some kind of hackathon, hackathon together, if you wish to work in groups on specific uh, topics. So really gr uh, great place. And we have some videos, inspiration videos, where we have Dennis as well there talking a little bit about his, his career and how he, he get into Power BI and Fabric topics. So really great resource. Feel free to check it out. And let's start with the announcements with the newest thing in Power BI. Uh, from my point of view, a very long awaited feature is now finally general available, the so-called VNet data gateway. In short, what it does is if you have a data source in Azure, like an Azure SQL database, for example, instead of installing an on-premise data gateway to be able to connect to it, you can now configure a VNet data gateway through which you can go and connect from Power BI to it. Um, it simplifies your life a little bit because you just configure it. There is no maintenance uh, update needed or, or anything else. It's just as a service and as such, it's an add additive premium infrastructure charge at the end. Uh, you see the calculation in the last point. Um, in short, it, it's roughly 72 cents per VNet per hour that it runs. That's what you're going to pay for it at the end. Any questions for that? Nothing in the room? Nothing in the call? Very good. Let's. Move on with the next one. RBI Copilot is now available worldwide. It's still in public preview, so not general available, but it's now available uh, for everyone uh, to be able to, uh, to, 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 to use it. There are some requirements that you need to meet. One of those is you need the minimum a premium P1 
or an F64 uh, capacity. And it has to be in a specific region. Uh, the regions are listed, are documented. You can easily search for it and check it out. Uh, but I think here in Switzerland, the most important piece is Switzerland North is supported. So you can uh, create a capacity here in Switzerland and Copilot is enabled. Uh, what you need to do on top is uh, you need to enable this tenant setting, which is highlighted. At the end, what does it mean is that Copilot, if you use it, that the processing of Copilot do not happen in your fabric region. It happens either in France or in the US. This is a little bit depending where your capacity is. So if you spin it up in Switzerland, the data will be sent to the France region. France uh, will, will process it and send it back to Switzerland and Copilot will show the result. I have a slide uh, explain a little bit in detail what will be sent so that we have a look there, but this is an important piece which we have to check. Um, from current uh, point of view, we try once Copilot is general available to make sure that it's available in each region, but um, I'm not sure if this will happen right away or if this will come, but this is for sure something that we're working on and that will be in future there so that you do not have to send outside of your specific region your data, uh, your, your metadata. And one important piece is Copilot is not supported on trials, so you really need to spin up a capacity to be able to use it. And as mentioned, I have a few slides uh, going a little bit through it to, to know what are the requirements and data privacy and stuff. As mentioned, uh, you need to enable it. You need a premium P1 or an F64. You need to enable the tenant setting, as mentioned. And all regions are listed in this link. And from a data security point of view, just to make sure that you're aware of it, we make sure that your data isn't used to train other models or or models or that we do not make your data available for other customers or for us as a needer so we're not going to use that at all and what uh copilot at the end uses is uh metadata i think we can see that yes we can see that on the next slide uh what what's Effectively used from Copilot is the user's prompt. So everything you put in into the prompt will be used and sent then to, in this case, friends, let's say. And it's it's uh, using as well meta information. In some cases, it can use specific data points. So it's not sending all the data, all the semantic model data to, to Copilot, it's sending probably specific data points to understand what you're looking for. So, so for example, if you say summarize uh, my total revenue, it has to know what the revenue is. So this is then a specific data point that needs to be processed. And other relevant information of the user. So for example, um, it has to know who is logged in. So in my case, if I log in, um, it has to know what I am supposed to see. And those information, those meta information are processed and used by Copilot at the end. Uh, all details, obviously, is documented, can be found in this link as well. From a limitation point of view, I'm going to show that as well, just in a second. Um, once Copilot has created visuals, those visuals cannot be modified anymore by Copilot itself. So, meaning you would need to do it on your own and it cannot add filters or set slicers right now. Uh, so if, as an example, you see you create a sales report for the last 30 days. The last 30 days cannot be interpreted by Copilot. So this is something that doesn't work. And it can also not make layout changes. So if you say to resize a visual or to align it or to whatever, uh, this will also not work. The limitations are listed as well in the documentation, as you see in the link. And from a charging point of view, um, it was free until 1st of March. Since then, so since a week roughly, um, we are charging now the usage of Copilot. And there is a difference between input tokens and output tokens. Input means everything you put in into the prompt. And 1,000 tokens, which is roughly 750 words. So it's not one word, one token. It's a little bit different but um, 1,000 tokens will use 400 capacity units. 
what capacity units are and so on. I will explain it later on when you go to the fabric metrics app. Uh, but for right now, this is this is the the information that that uh, that is needed. 1,000 input tokens, 400 CUs, and the output. So everything that Copilot generates, output tokens are using 1,200 CUs. So this means at the end there is no direct charging of Copilot. From my point of view, it's an indirect charging because you pay for the capacity. The capacity is used by Copilot, and this is how you're going to be built at the end. And as well, further details can be found in this link over here. But enough talking, let me show you a little bit the magic of Copilot. So I went here to Power BI. Uh, this is my standard report coming in a, in a workspace. The workspace itself, just to show you, is backed up with a, uh, with a capacity. In my case, in my specific case, I can use a trial. This will not work in your case. Uh, we here at Microsoft have some specific um, permissions, let's say. That's the reason why it's going to work. But as mentioned, in your case, you would need to go with a premium or F64 capacity. Once there, um, we have two differentiations, let's say. One is in view mode and another one is in edit mode. Obviously, if you are in view mode, you cannot create reports or pages or whatever. For that, you will need to switch to edit. So let me do that from right away. And if I switch to edit mode, we see the co-pilot button over here. And if I open it up, I will get a prompt user interface on the right hand side, as you see. And from here, I can now start prompting. I can start writing what I wish to achieve or what I wish that Copilot does for me. What I will always see as well is some kind of suggestions. In my case, I have two of them. One is suggest content for this report, and the other one is create a page that shows. So it just starts, and I have to end the sentence. And let me go with the first one. If I click suggest content for this report, if I select it, you see it's like the, it's what I texted, let's say, and sent to Copilot. And very thank you very much for something went wrong. Let me retry that. <clears throat> yes, I tested it an hour ago <laughs> and it worked. So it has to work one more time. So uh, let me go to edit mode. Let me say copilot suggest content. <clears throat> ah, working a little bit longer. Looks like it's working now. There we are. We have now a suggestion uh, of four different topics in this case. One is sales performance analysis. Another is um, creating a customer buying behavior page. Then we have product performance metrics and employee sales contribution. In my case, I just go for the first one. What I can do is I can just say here now the create button. If I select it, again, Copilot will work on it. As you see, it always takes some seconds, let's say 10 seconds, 20 seconds probably um, to, to perform the action. But especially for creating the report, I think it's worth to wait those seconds. As we will see, we will get really a new page, everything created, which I can use. It's a, it's, it's a report at the end with the layout, with the theme that I have. And, and because it's just a, another Power BI page, I can already use it, reshape it, redesign it as I wish. It takes a little bit longer than expected, but I'm sure we will get there. This is always a good point to, to ask questions if you have any. One question. Yes. There is the suggestions with Copilot in quick measure. Mm -hmm. Is this also part uh, of this F1 or yes. I have to pay? Yes. Okay. I'll come to that. Yeah. Um, I'll show as well another feature with DAX measures uh, descriptions. Uh, at the end, regardless which Copilot you're going to use, you will always need to back it up by an F64 or a P1 or higher. In the meantime, the report page has created, has been created. And as you see, we have the same color. That's at least something. We have already some <clears throat> KPIs at the top. We have some uh, visuals which we can use. And it's a Power BI report, as mentioned, meaning if I select something, everything else will automatically be filtered, highlighted, whatever. So this works perfectly fine. 
and I can go further and not only create pages, I can also say, um, for example, summarize the three most interesting uh, bindings of this page. Make a bullet point list. Point list. And Copilot will really go check out now what's on this page and try to summarize the three most important findings or interesting findings in this case and make it a bullet point list for me. Let's see if that works. <clears throat> and what I've learned working with Copilot that prompting, meaning what I'm entering here, is very important. As an example, we have Copilot as well in Dataflow Gen 2. And it's a difference if I write extract year, save into new column, or if I say create new column and extract year, because in the second uh, second uh, place it works and in the first one it doesn't. So it's really important how you prompt. And if the result is not what you expect, just try to rewrite what you need or what you're trying to achieve. And in my case, now, um, Copilot has finished. I see three bullet points at what I'm looking for. I see some summary. OK, the company had a sharp increase in total, included text, blah, blah, blah. And one of the most important things from my point of view as well is the reference. Probably you see that I have here numbers. And those numbers are indicating from which visual this information is coming from. Meaning if I select number one here, OK, I cannot select it here. I can select it in other visual. And um, it says it's calculated insights. And this one is coming from the total including text. Probably I can select this one. Yes. If I select this one, you see it's highlighting me the visual. Uh, I cannot select on the number one because this is calculated insight. I don't have that. This is a uh, co-pilot has calculated on his own. And this is also very, very useful to know that it's really referencing to something and not just blowing or uh, yeah, making something up. From a limitation point of view, as mentioned in the in the in the doc, um, we cannot say okay, increase now this visual or resize the visual. Um, if you try resize first visual and make it half page big, for example, sometimes it says sorry, I cannot do that. I'm not supporting that. As you see here. Sometimes you don't even get an error message. It just doesn't do anything at the end. So don't be surprised uh, if you hit a limitation and don't get even a response. This is what, what could happen at the end. All right. Please. Power Query Desktop, no. You can create measures there, and you can. I will show that that's new. We can also create descriptions of measures now. Uh, but prompting like this, it's not supported in, in desktop. I'm not sure if you're working on it, but haven't seen it. And with Power Query, yes, with data flows. With data flow Gen 2, we offer that exactly. Probably at the end, if you have enough time, I can also show that quickly. But it's more or less the same experience. Copilot button, you have a prompt on the right, and write what you wish. Any further questions? Just like data quality and so on. Haven't tried it? <laughs> not sure. Don't think so, because it, we're not really reading data. We're just reading metadata. No. <clears throat> what? See no questions? Then let me go back to the PowerPoint slide to the next one. Uh, talking about Copilot, we have, uh, as a little bit mentioned, we have now a new feature in Power BI Desktop, meaning we can now use Copilot to generate descriptions of our measures, which is super useful for if you hover over a measure to know what this measure is for, what does it do. And as we know, documentation of measures is not the most interesting job, so probably Copilot can be used to speed that process up a little bit. As is it a preview feature, you need to enable it in the options and settings, options, preview features. In there, you will find measures description with Copilot. And as mentioned previously, even if you use it in desktop, you still need to back it up by. <coughs> um, if you do it the first time and you try to run it, you will get a pop up asking which workspace you wish to assign to it. And the <coughs> workspace obviously backed up 
higher capacity at the end. So let me show that. If I go to Parallel Desktop, first of all, files, options and settings, options, <coughs> and second preview feature. Uh, okay, where is it? It's one of those preview features. Uh, da -da -da -da. There it is. This one. You have to enable manager descriptions with Copilot. Restart desktop once there. You can voila, you can go then to the model view. In the model view, in the model tab is the easiest way. You can see all the measures that you have. And if I select now a measure, I have here the description of this measure, and you see already the button create with Copilot. And if I do that, if I select it, and takes a few seconds. Uh, Power BI Copilot tries then to create a measure. And what do we see is this is the current measure. None means we have no description behind, which is absolutely true. And this is coming from Copilot. And it says this measure calculates the total revenue by summing up all the values in the revenue column of the sales table. Sounds good. If I wish, I can now say try again to see if I get another result. If it's okay, I can say keep it, or if I don't wish to do anything, I can just discard it and it will be gone. In my case, let's say keep it. And just like that, I created now a description. As you see, it's text. I can obviously also override it. This is my comment, for example, and I have it already in my measure as description. And the beauty of it is if I go now to my report view, if I go now to sales, I think it's here, KPI. And if I go hover over it, you see the description is here. And now I know what this measure does for me. Questions? One question as before. Can we mm -hmm. do the same with all the other query online? Like in the query, query you have all those different steps. And you have the chance to add a description if you want. Uh, not out of the box, but probably you can prompt it. Haven't tested it, but probably you can go through the prompt and say, can you create a description for this field? Take it and just paste it then in this case. Yeah, but not like this. Uh, I haven't seen this feature that it's done, uh, that it's doing it automatically. Any further questions? Okay. Pretty clear. Let me then go back again to PowerPoint. Um, one... Christian, 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 Mohammed, I am sorry. Uh, uh, all good. So basically, you mentioned that uh, that we can do this, uh, create the workspace in Switzerland. But how can I do that? For example, I am based on Switzerland. Hmm? Okay, I am based in Geneva. So the tenant should be registered configured in Europe, for example, in Switzerland or what? Mm -hmm. I will show the process of how to create a fabric capacity a little bit later on. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Then let me move on with the next announcement, which is the visual calculation. Um, pretty awesome from my point of view as now, as of now, you can write and execute the duck statements directly in the visual and you will see immediately the result. Uh, the visual calculation is something that it's not added to your data model. It's really bound to the visual itself. And it's a little bit, I wouldn't say totally different, but it eases up a little bit the process how you can now write tax statements. And I will show some examples. Again, it's a uh, preview feature, so you need to enable it as I shown before. and making sure that you check box that you mark the checkbox to have it so let me show that if i go again to my power bi report um let me um select for example this line chart Re regardless what kind of chart you have to first select it and once you have selected it this new calculation button will uh, will be displayed or not displayed but not grayed out anymore and i can select it and now uh, I have this visual calculation um, user interface in which I can do 
my 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 docs. As you see down below, I can just start writing it and I can also reference to other measures within my visual. If I create a, a visual calculation, I can also create a second visual calculation referencing to the first one. So that's also not an issue. So everything which which uh, what is in the visual I can reference to. One of the best features from my point of view is as well if i click here on this fx i have some let's call it templates which i can use to really easy up my life and say for example if i wish to create a running sum i can just select it i get how it should look like and i just need to provide the field now so let me do that i'm providing here uh, what is it called revenue yes revenue hitting enter and two things had happened or three things happened already. Show that first is obviously my running sum is now added. The running sum is added as well in the visual, so I can see it, this black line here. And I can see as well on the right hand side that this visual, uh, that this uh, calculation is added into my visual and it has a specific sign to it indicating that this is a visual calculation. Going on, I can also do uh, further stuff. So for example, versus previous, if I wish. Again, if I select it, you see, I just need to overwrite what I'm looking for. So in this case, fields. So let me go with revenue. Let me go with revenue here as well. And what it does, it's now uh, comparing with the previous, uh, with the previous value, what's Important to understand is that it's calculating on a row by row base, and we see that here as well. It's really going to the um, to the yeah. It's it's creating a versus the previous value at the end, and and it's not just um, calculating over there. And in this case, it's the same value. If I take that, you see there is no difference. Therefore, zero again against the other value from the previous one. No difference. Therefore, zero. Uh, now taking 35,000 because we have minus 3,000, the difference is 38,000, and so on, and so on. And again, the line has just been added. And this will work, obviously, on any, on, on any other visual as well that is supporting visual calculation right now. And which are uh, and which one are those? You see, the ones that are grayed out are not supported at the end. That's the reason why they're grayed out. Questions? No hands raised, nothing from the chat. All right. <clears throat> then let me go back to the slides. We are. Um, one um, exciting feature, especially from a developer point of view, is that we now support TMDL, so called tabular model definition language. And this is also a public preview feature. And what does it do? At the end, it simplifies how the structure of your data model will be saved. And it's more easy to read, access, overwrite it. And what happens behind the scene is on the left hand side, if you use, if you use, let's say, the, the common way until today, you will have a BIM file, which is at the end something kind of adjacent. And if you go with the TMDL, this BIM file will be gone and you will have a folder definition called. And in this definition folder, you will have subfolders for uh, tables, for roles, perspective and cultures. And in there, um, the, the, the models or the, the, the language itself is also a little bit easier to read. So let me show that what I mean. If we go again to this Power BI report, if I go to file, if I if I say options and settings, just to show you first that you need to enable that. <clears throat> Preview feature. You see over here, store semantic model using TMDL. If you enable that and you say save, save as, let me say browse. I am here in my 
folder called Fabric User Group Switzerland. If I say save it here as, and this is important, PBIP file, not X, so it has to be the PBIP file. If I hit save, what will happen is following. I have two folders, one for the report and one for the data set itself. And if I go now to the data set, <clears throat> as you see, there is no BIM file anymore missing. I have now the definition folder. And if I go into this definition folder, I have a folder for the tables, perspective and cultures. I would have one for roles if I would specify one, but I don't have one, therefore no folder. And if I go, for example, now to tables, I see all the tables already here. So I have a country table, I have KPI and I have a sales table, and I have two not best practice followed tables, which is the date table template, just ignore them. <laughs> uh, but those three tables that I marked are here as well. So I can see them KPI, country and sales. And if I use now, for example, uh, Visual Studio Code, let me open that. And if I go to my Fabric User Group Switzerland, to my definition, to my table, and open up, for example, country, make that big, it's much more readable than everything before that we had. And you see the table called country. This is the lineage tag uh, ID at the end. I have here a column called country code. It, this is the data type of it. We say, should it be summarized or not? And what is the source column at the end? And I can easily overwrite that if I wish, save it, and Power BI will recognize that. And for those who are wondering why I have such a nice overview of this TMDL and why it's also um, color coding and stuff. What I did on top under add-ins or extensions, I installed the TMDL extension, which helps me to make it colorish, let's say, and make it such nice to read at the end. And this is the biggest benefit of this TMDL uh, format. I can really read easy uh, every file of it, and uh, I can more or I can easier, let's say, uh, do now my my uh, deployment in an automatic way, find differences and stuff like this. One thing to note is once you saved it with TMDL enabled and you save it now to Azure DevOps or to Git, uh, TMDL will also be saved in this way in Git. And if you sync it then to, to the Power BI workspace, it will also be TMDL and the other way around. If you don't do so, we will per default still use the old, uh, the older language, let's say, which is not TMDL, it's TM, CL, TM, OL, no, no, not, not sure what the, what the acronym is, uh, but it's not TMDL, let's put it that way. Um, if you wish to upgrade, that's that's no issue at all. You just need to enable it and save as again and uh, as a PBIP file, and it will um, upgrade your current report, and it will work at the end. All right. Any questions for that? TMSL. TMSL. Thank you very much. TMSL is the older definition uh, language. All right. If no questions for that, let me move on with updates to Power BI apps. Uh, we did some updates over here. Um, one, let's say, more interesting one from my point of view is that until now, you had the possibility of creating 10 different audiences. We increased this number now to 25, meaning you can have 25 different audiences in a single app and really have a fine granular uh, security model in there. Uh, on top, we have uh, a navigation pane setting now saying, do you wish to collapse the navigation pane from the beginning or should it be expanded? So if you collapse it, probably if you have a lot of, of navigation panes, uh, it will be a little bit more readable and user friendly. Further, you can also give access to hidden content. So as an example, if you have a hidden content, for example, a link or whatever, and uh, per default or until now, 
users couldn't have access to it. Now you can turn this on and specify access to it if you wish, so that if you have a link from a page to this hidden page that people can access. And lastly, if you have a link um, on your app, you can now easily copy this link uh, through the UI if you wish to do so. So let me show that live. If I go here to a workspace, say update app. In here, I have now under the advanced settings, as you see, I can choose do I wish to expand or collapse my navigation pane, and do I wish to give access to hidden content? And if I go to content, let me create uh, quickly a new link. Uh, test. Okay. UG and say OK. And if I go now to it, as you see, I can now edit link. OK, I don't have copy link. Very good. I can go with something else. Google. Let's try that. Update. OK. Not sure why, but uh, in here you should have copy link. Um, as you, as you saw in the screenshot, to make a little bit your life easier. And in the last piece, you can now click 24 times to create a new audience because one you have already, therefore you can create 24 more at the end. Any questions to that? Pretty easy one. <clears throat> Two, three more things. Um, one is we announced a deprecation of machine learning models for data flow gen one, starting by end of March 28th, uh, 28th to be exact, meaning uh, un, um, starting from then, you will not be able to, cr uh, to create machine learning models anymore with data flows gen one. Uh, instead, you can go and use the automated machine learning models or solutions within Microsoft Fabric. This is like the replication of it, more or less. And further, we also announced the retirement of so-called legacy Power BI apps. At the end, what it means is every app in which you do not see audiences is a legacy Power BI app. And it will still work after 1st of May, but you will not get technical support for it. This is at the end what it means. And if you have such kind of an app, um, best is if you just upgrade it, it's super simple. You can just go to the workspace and say upgrade now and you're done, or you unpublish the app and publish it again, and you will be upgrading it this way as well. And that's it. And one last little hidden uh, hidden game that I saw today. I, I wasn't aware of it, so just wanted to share with you as well. Um, in Pravia Desktop, in the semantic bundle, if you select it, you will see now the local host that you are connected to. So there is no need to go through CMD or the command line or any other tool to check it out somehow. It's really written there, which is from my point of view, uh, again, easy ups my life, meaning if I go here to the model, select, especially here on the semantic model, you see now the local host that this Power BI desktop is using. And if needed, I can copy it and use it in a third party tool that I wish to use, just that you are aware of it as well. Ooh, all right. Christian. Yes. Christian, sorry. Can you show us example for the legacy app? No, I don't have one. <laughs> uh, no, any. <laughs> It's just the an thing, example. Yeah, the thing is, if you go to a workspace, yeah, and uh, give me a sec. If it's a Sorry, legacy, but I would like. Uh, I, I need to understand this because to avoid any any effect on the. Yes, uh, the thing I, I really don't have a legacy app anymore to show you life. But what would happen is you will have here a message saying you need to upgrade, and this mesh message looks as following. See, upgrade this app to the latest version. If you don't see that, you don't have to worry. And I need to hit the upgrade now, and that's it. Yes, that's so, it. So, uh, and, uh, and then I can download the, the new version 
from the work, uh, from the workspace and republished again, correct? It, that's a second way to do so. There, if you say upgrade now, you don't need to unpublish it. You just say upgrade now and you're good. No, maybe you, you didn't get my question. So my question, because for example, I have uh, I have the the desktop version, for example, yes. and still this one with legacy also. So if I refer, if I upgrade on the work uh, from the uh, from the PI service, so the version in the PI service is already upgraded. But if I did any change from the Power PI desktop and I published. I will re overwrite and still also with the legacy app. So, so in this case, I need after the upgrade, download the version from PI service and I start to use this one for the future or any further update uh, change. And um, it, it's not that complex at all. Um, ah, don't okay. mix, yeah, don't mix the Power BI app with Power BI desktop. Um, because it has nothing to do at the end with one with the uh, with each other. This is really just a Power BI app in the service. Okay. And if you have one, and in this case called legacy, as mentioned, you will see this, this info message and you can just upgrade. It will not touch your report at all. And you do okay. not need to open it up somehow in desktop and republish it from desktop or anything. When I, when I say unpublish, what I mean is following. If I created an app uh, from a workspace, you see here update app. But what I can do as well is I can say unpublish app and the app will not be available anymore. But the report itself is still there and it's still untouched. And if you upgrade it, it's still, the report still works. You, so you do not need to do anything with desktop or update or download or anything else. I got what you mean. Okay, clear. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any further questions? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I have a question. Um, I work now with a with a customer, and um, they um, gave me access right to the workspace. I also have um, a Power um, BI Pro license from my employer, but every time I um, open the link, it says uh, you don't have access to this group so i cannot uh, see the workspace of the of the customer do you um, have any idea what what could be the issue there yes can you make sure that if you go to power bi of your customer that you go to settings uh, no sorry to the question mark that you say about power bi and mm -hmm. in here, you have the tenant URL. Can you please make sure to use this tenant URL and that you log in? Once logged in, you will see the workspace of your customer. OK. Because I, if I understood you right, um, you are a guest account in the customer tenant, right? Um, yes, uh, um, I'm not 100% sure, but um, I opened the link I got from from the customer. Yes. And uh, um, also in incognito mode in the browser. And I always get this uh, message. Um, let me see. I have it here. <laughs> um, Leider haben Sie keinen Zugriff auf diese Gruppe. Wir haben Sie zu Ihrem persönlichen Arbeitsbereich weitergeleitet. But yeah. I guess this is the issue as you are okay. a guest user. Then. Okay. Try that way. It's, mm -hmm. um, that, that would be my, my first guess. Otherwise, but it's that, just a permission. The tenant URL, that should be something the, the customer looks up because yes. I, okay. Okay, yes. got this you. is something that your customer needs to provide you. Then log in. Once logged in, um, you will be, as mentioned, logged in in your customer tenants, Power, uh, Power BI tenant. And then on the workspaces, you will see the workspaces that you have access to. And that's it. Okay, it, it was the question mark and then. Um... Question mark. And then you have about Power BI about? here at the bottom. Uh, and then if you ah. select that, you will see here the tenant. Okay, about Power BI. Thank you. Hope it helps. 
yes, I hope too. <laughs> All right, then we had quite a few updates um, and still one hour to go. And now let's move on to the fabric capacity metric set. So first of all, this is interesting, I would say, for those who are working already with a capacity, uh, let it be uh, a fabric premium or uh, embedded, even Power BI embedded will be shown, uh, will be uh, visible here, or even a trial. So if you try to understand what is happening on your fabric trial, this capacity metrics app will help you as well. Um, first things first, uh, just to know what we're going to do or what we're going to cover. I will just quickly explain again what fabric is and what the fabric capacity is so that we are all aligned. Um, then we will start with the metrics app, try to understand what it looks like, what it does, how the calculation happens over there. And then we have a, a, a let's call it a best practice approach to set up a notification so that you're not getting throttled. And lastly, some general best practices that you are aware of it. Um, for those who, who missed it so far, just that you know, we announced Microsoft Fabric back in May, and this is uh, what we call unified data platform in the era of AI. And what does it mean is that with Fabric, the idea is that we can really unify all kinds of different services. Let it be Synapse Data Engineering, let it be Warehousing, let it be Power BI, Data Activator, uh, Data Factory, uh, real-time analytics, and so on, and so on. And the main idea is that you can store your data in what we call one leg. This is like the one drive for your data, and you really just have one. So there is no need to, or there is no possibility even to create multiple one legs. You just have one across your whole tenant. And once you create it, the, uh, your one leg and store your data there, the idea is that regardless which, let's call it service, you're going to use, data factory, warehousing, Power BI, or data activator, or Synapse uh, real-time analytics, whatever, that you can access it, always the same data, through this serverless compute. Serverless in this case means you have this fabric capacity or a premium capacity. You spin it up once, and you do not have to specify if this capacity is for data factory, is it for Synapse web warehousing, is it for Power BI or whatever, you just spin it once and you can already use then the different services in there. The benefit of this is, or one of the benefits is for sure, um, for example, networking uh, configuration. Um, imagine previously, if you wish to have a, a database or a warehouse, you have to first make sure that this warehouse is visible for Power BI somehow, that it can be accessed. Same is true for Data Factory, and you have to make sure that one with each other can, can communicate. And in this case, this is already done because you are in the Power BI ecosystem and you do not have to take care of it at the end. And fabric capacity or premium capacity at the end is what we need. This is what this serverless compute in the middle stands for. Um, Serverless is half true, I would say, because you still need to spin up this capacity. When it's running, then everything else will just consume this capacity. All right. So what's a capacity? As mentioned, it's like a shared resource that provides this capacity or the hardware at the end that can be leveraged through other services, this data factory and Power BI and everything else in there, as well as Copilot, as we saw before. And we have different kind of capacity. Here is uh, the, the official table, um, starting with an F2, going up to 2048, uh, comparing a little bit to what we had so far with premium capacities and Azure embedded capacities. Um, we see that we have even two smaller ones and one bigger that we had uh, until now. And one thing to note is, an, for example, an F64, let me mark that. And F64 means we have 64 capacity units, therefore the name F64, which is the equivalent of a P1 or an A4, which had previously eight cores. I say previously because we're not calculating anymore with cores, we're calculating with capacity units. 
And this will be important in the later stage when I'm going to explain the metric set. All right. Um, capacity units, as mentioned, it's it's all we're going to care about. And how the capacity works is it calculates within 30 second time points how much you used. And if you overuse it, you will, yeah, you will kick in probably throttling and stuff like this. And if you don't, you're good enough, so you you haven't used 100% of your capacity. And how is it calculated at the end? As mentioned, one time point is always 30 seconds. And now, if we use an F2 with two CUs, we multiply 30 seconds with two capacity units, meaning we have 60 capacity units for one time point which we can use. Meaning per minute it, it's 120, per hour and per day it's more and more. But the most important piece is just multiply the F skew by 30 to have the CUs that you can use per time point. All right. If we go further, how can we see how much we have used? As mentioned, this is the Microsoft Fabric Capacity Metrics app that will show how much is used. And it's pretty easy to, to install it. Um, we can just go to get apps, search for it, install it, and uh, run it, configure it. And once done, we will see already the usage of our metrics uh, of our capacity. I will show that live after the demo so you have a feeling how and where it is. Right now, working a little bit more with, with the slides. Once you install, you will have a similar uh, similar view that I have here on the, on the top, uh, bottom right. And one thing to note, this is one of the most important visuals from the beginning, because what we see here is a dotted line. This dotted line indicates how much my capacity um, or wh where is the limit of my capacity, so the 100%. And I see already that two times I get over my limit. And at first, it could look bad because I overused my capacity, but now the complex stuff kicks in <laughs> because it's not that easy anymore. On one hand, it's good because we as Microsoft, we offer you that you can overuse your capacity within some minutes, but this doesn't make it easier to understand the metric set. That's a little bit the thing. All right. What does it mean? As mentioned, we see those two peaks and even with those two peaks, there hasn't been any performance impact. So users could still go to access the report and they haven't noticed anything at all. Why? Because now we are not looking anymore at peaks. We are looking at average um, consumption, calculating on these time points and calculating on a time frame between five and 10 minutes. I will show that as well during the demo. What does it mean? So this means, on the other hand, that even if you have a peak usage, you can overuse your capacity for a few minutes without being throttled. How does it work? We introduced what uh, something called bursting and smoothing, which at the end means you can overuse it by a, uh, by a certain uh, percentage. And once the capacity is not used anymore, you just pay back what you have overused before. And bursting in this case means that if you have a job that should run for 60 minutes on a 64 capacity unit capacity that you have, it could happen that it will run within 15 minutes and you just used 256 CUs in this case, even if your capacity is just 64. This is what bursting does. And this is not something that you can influence. This is something that we do automatically for you if it allows to do so, if you do not overuse your capacity. And uh, this is mostly done with so-called backend uh, operations. I'm not sure if this is happening with, uh, with uh, interactive operations. I will show that as well just in a minute what the difference is. Smoothing, on the other hand, means um, 
it can happen as mentioned that you overused now your capacity like in this example with 256 CUs for 15 minutes and the next 45 minutes you're not using it at all and those 45 minutes will be used to pay back what you have overused this is more or less how smoothing and bursting works and obviously this cannot be done unlimitless so there has to be some kind of a limit and this limit for smoothing is that if you smooth over a minimum of five minutes or longer, and or longer means up until 10 minutes, um, it will still work. If you use it more than 10 minutes, interactive operations will be delayed. This means if I, if I as a user go and select a report, it will have a delay of 20 seconds. So the user will have to wait 20 seconds more to load the report just to um, just to make sure that your capacity is not overused and have a saving mechanism. If it's more than 60 minutes that you use smoothing, we will block um, interactive operations. So no user can access any report anymore. And if it's more than 24 hours, then we will uh, throttle the whole capacity. So then it means you cannot do anything anymore on this capacity until you paid back everything at the end. Um, this can be seen here in this table, what I just explained. Um, in short, it, again, it means if you smooth, if you use smoothing within five and ten minutes window, uh, there is no real uh, issue. If it's more than ten minutes, but below sixty minutes, it's just an interactive delay. So reports will be delayed to access them. If it's more than sixty minutes, more than one hour, reports cannot be accessed anymore. And if it's more than twenty-four hours, everything will be throttled. So meaning that the refreshes in the back end, for example, will not happen. And I, exp uh, and I said already a little bit, uh, we have interactive and uh, backend operation. What does it mean? Interactive at the end means if I interact with my UI or with a report or with anything, and this is what an interactive operation is. Uh, as you see, it's uh, calling a Pavia report, but it could also be if I um, if I use SQL Server Management Studio and execute a duck statement, this is also something interactive that I do as a user at the end. All types of operations can be found in this link, as well as the background operation and background at the end. Um, in short, are um, data set refreshes, data warehouses refreshes, or if you have an XMLA based refresh, those kind of things are backend operation. So far, so good. Any questions? All right, let's get back to, to, the, to the example that I have. So in my case, I did a, a load assessment. Uh, it was by, on the 23rd of January. That's the reason why we see just one date in here. And as mentioned, we have two peaks. So let us understand what exactly happened. And I have in my report, which is important, I have at the top right, three different tabs over here. So I have utilization, throttling, and overages. And in the utilization, I see how much I utilized my capacity and I have two peaks. And if I click on throttling in here, I will see if I have been throttled. And again, I have three sub tabs, which will indicate if an interactive delay has happened, interactive rejection or background rejection. So this is the, the metrics that I showed. And in my specific case, I hit just a little bit over here, the interactive delay. So this would mean if someone at roughly 7 p.m. would access a report, the report would take 20 seconds longer to load. Going further and selecting the interactive rejection, I see I'm far away from a rejection. So it's not that bad. It could just happen that the report at a 7 p.m. more or less would have taken longer, but I have no rejection, meaning my capacity works as, as, as uh, desired and there is no rejection at the end. And from a background perspective, um, I'm below 1% uh, meaning there is no rejection from the background. So I have do not have to worry about it at the end. And what has happened during the overages, meaning if I select the third tab overages, I will see 
that during my peak time, afterwards, the blue line over here indicates that I have paid back my debt. So I see that this smoothing works. I overused it and immediately after I paid back what I overused because the capacity hasn't been used afterwards. And what I can do is I can select uh, any time point here. So I can select, for example, here uh, exactly this line. And once I select something, the Explore button will not be grayed out anymore. And if I select the Explore button, I will drill through to the second page, which will show me, let me make it bigger, which will show me exactly what is happening. So I have all the interactive operations at the top and all the background operations in the middle. And I will see which user has uh, created them, and what exactly is going on. So I have here, for example, the workspace name. I have the item. So is it a data set, a notebook? Is it lake house, whatever? And the name of the item at the end. This is the operation that is running. So in this case, query. So meaning I just open it and it's querying uh, the semantic model. I see as well the start and end date. And what's interesting over here is following. I see the total capacity units per seconds needed for each specific uh, operation. And let me let me uh, do that one more time. This one indicates really the total CUs needed. For now, probably not that important. What's more important is how many CUs has been used for this specific time point. Remember, a time point is always 30 seconds. And the time point itself can be seen at the top left. So this time it's 6.32 until 6.32.30. Okay? And during this time point, I have used in total 2,700-ish uh, capacity units. And I'm using an F64, and in theory, I have a total of 1,000 920 CUs. This means I overused my capacity by 43%. And the math, just to prove, is really correct. I did the math already. Meaning if I calculate this 2747.36 capacity units that are used divided by 1920 that I have available, I see that I have, uh, let me make it 100, I have 143%. And this is exactly the number that I have here as well. So the math is really correct, showing me how much I overused it. All right. Two more things which we can see as well here is, this is the graph that we have seen previously as well with a peak. And at every time point, or, or I can select anywhere in this graph to select a time point. And in my case, I am now at this, let's call it break even, where, the where we see that the peak is going down and we're hitting already almost the 100% capacity again. And at this point in time, what has happened is that we overused the capacity uh, previously a few times. And everything or every time we, we uh, overused it will be saved in the overages um, visual. Meaning, starting from roughly 626.30, we overused it a little bit. It's roughly, I would say, 25%. In the next time point, we overused it by roughly 55-60%. Then we overused it again by roughly 100%, and so on, and so on. And the red line is cumulating every overusage and showing me on the right-hand side how much I overused it. So this is the cumulation, the red line, and the green line on the axis uh, is bound to the left axis, showing me per time point how much I have overused it. And I have as well the cumulative overusage here as well. 
Now the biggest difference, why do I see here over 1000 and why do I see here 600? These graphs shows me in minutes and this one per time point. And time point is 30 seconds. And this one is roughly 1200, right? Divided by two gives us this 600%. That's a little bit the reason. Now it's getting interesting because if I go to the next time point, so 60, uh, 632.30 until 6.33, let me do so, we see following. You see, I selected the next time point over here. I see at this time point, I'm using roughly 68% of my capacity, meaning roughly 32 of my capacity is not used. Therefore, we can pay back 32% to what we have used before. And this is indicated as well in the overages graphic over here. And we see now the blue graph showing me a burn down. So we're paying back now 32% of what we have used or overused. And if we go now time point by time point, at some point in time, we will see that we have paid back everything that we overused, and we have now everywhere zero on the burn down table, meaning we have now paid back everything and we're good to go. And therefore, no throttling has happened because we could have paid back within 10 minutes and no performance impact and I don't have to scale or anything. Is it clear? Any questions so far? Clear enough. Okay, I know it's not a super, super easy topic, but I hope you get it. Okay, in conclusion, what does it mean? And um, one more time, we're not looking anymore at peak usage, meaning if I have a peak like this, it doesn't mean it's super bad and you need to scale automatically. It just means you would need to check how much or how long this peak has taken place. And you have to look if you are able to. Uh, to to pay it back and if throttling has happened. If so, then probably you need to optimize or to, to resize. If not, you're good to go. As an example, this is a real life customer example. Sorry for the bad screenshot at the top. This is what you just got provided. And um, this is an example of how it can look like if you get throttled. In this case, we have a lot of background operations. You see that with the with the bluish um, bluish um, charts here, and it exceeds the 100% limit over here. And because everything is backend, this just means I have too many, I guess, data set refreshes or data pipeline running or whatever, and therefore it's exceeding. And because the uh, it's above 100% over 10 minutes or over a certain period of time, uh, you will be throttled and this is also visible on the throttling tab that during this time a lot of users has been throttled and they had a lot of complaints that power reports are not opening up and the reason was as we saw background operations in this case and what can you do in such cases is you really need to check the capacity you really need to understand the capacity metrics app, and you really need to understand what exactly is causing this issue by exploring, going into the details and stuff. And in this specific case, it was a pipeline that was um, that was running and used a lot of capacity units. And how can you avoid that you get surprised by such kind of a behavior is that you set up a notification. So we really, 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 really recommend to go into your capacity um, into the settings of it. And in there you have a notification tab which you can set up saying, for example, like in the screenshot, if 80% of your capacity is used, please send me a notification. And you can even specify to whom should it be the capacity admin or someone else. Um, and once you, you hit this limit, you will get an email indicating, hey, Probably you should have a look into it, make sure that you're not getting throttled or whatever. Further, and from experience with, with, with my customers so far, is if you wish to try out Fabric, how Fabric works, here are some best practices. First of all, um, 
it's it's hard to predict how much capacity will be used by each item, by a report, by a data pipeline, by whatever. And it the best is really just to try to create a POC, try to, to create a, a test environment where you test out and check the fabric capacity app to see how much load you have produced. If you wish, you can also uh, generate a load assessment. That's what I did in, in my case to, to see how much load it can get. It will give you a feeling, but nevertheless, we still recommend to do a quick POC, a quick test to a better experience, better feeling how much uh, capacity usage will, will produce your items. One of the most important pieces, don't do that on a production environment, do that really on a separate capacity. So it's super easy to spin it up. I will show that just in a minute or two. It's super easy to spin up a capacity and really separate it from your production to have a test or POC environment for that. If you wish, you can even create multiple capacities and isolate and isolating the workloads, meaning you create a capacity for Power BI, a capacity for a lake house, for a data factory, whatever. And in this case, you really, really have a good view on how much usage of the capacity each item does or needs. Um, one thing as well is once you go from, from this POC, MVP, pilot, whatever you're going to call it, into production, make sure you have a standardized process to see do you have enough capacity units left on your current production environment or not? Do you need to scale up or not? So this is also an important piece, not just to deploy to production and good luck. As mentioned, set up a monitoring. I would recommend something between 70 and 80% to get the notification. And uh, if you are, especially in the POC, if you are there, you can easily scale up and down your capacity. You can even pause it to save cost. So it doesn't need to run 24 seven, if not really needed. Hey, what question, if I just use one CEO to pass it on the service, then I can see the breakdown of the channels how much each service Yes, yes. Uh, let me show that probably a little bit live. So first of all, where do I do create a capacity? For that, I need to go to the Azure portal. In there, I need a sufficient permission on a subscription, for example, a contributor or whatever. And um, once I have that, I can go into the search bar here, or I can say create a resource. I go to the search bar. I can search for Microsoft Fabric and select it. <clears throat> Once selected, in my case, you see I have two capacities called load testing and another one. And if I wish, I can say now create, create a new one, and I will be guided now um, <clears throat> to create a new one. What I need, as mentioned, is a subscription. Subscription at the end means who's going to pay the bill. This is, this is the subscription, what it does. So let me take, for example, here a quick demo. I need a resource group. Resource group in, in Azure world is yeah, you're grouping your resources together. And if you delete the resource group, for example, all the resources in there can be deleted. Next, the capacity name. So for example, Fabric User Group Switzerland. And now I can choose my region. Oh, only lowercase, sorry, Fabric User Group Switzerland should work. And this is the place, as mentioned, where you can choose your region you wish to deploy your capacity. This can be different of your tenant location. So if your tenant, for example, is in West Europe, you can still choose Switzerland North. And I can now set up the size. Per default, it's an F64. But if I click on change size, you see I can change the size as I wish. For example, let's go with an F2. Let's select. Now the fabric capacity admin that's also needed. Per default, it's my user there. And I can already go and say review and create. It's perfectly fine. Say create. And it takes a few minutes to create this capacity. While this is in process, let me go back to over here. In here, once created, the third capacity will be listed. And you see if I select now, for example, the PBI Guy Fabric Playground. In there, I have the possibility to pause or run my capacity. In this case, it's running because I see the pause button. If it would be paused, 
I would see a resume button. What else do I see? Probably this one is important. The size of it right now is an F2, uh, but I wish to resize. I can easily go to change size over here and change the size to what I wish. Hit resize and it will be resized. And that's it. Once this is done, I can go to Power BI. I can go to settings, to admin portal. And on the left hand side, I have here capacity settings. And if I select that, I can see all my capacities divided by premium, embedded, trial, and fabric. And if I select fabric, you see already my fabric user group Switzerland has been deployed now. It's running, it's an F2, so I can use it. This one, which is in cursive and a little, and a little bit grayed out, it just means it's not running. So it's in a pause state. That's the reason why, why it's a little bit um, grayed out. And if I select now my capacity, I am uh, now in the settings of it. And as an example, we see here now the notification, which I set up to 80%. So I can I will be notified if I reach 80%. Following best practices. Lastly, I have to assign this capacity now to a workspace. If I go to my Fabric user group workspace, if I go to the settings of it, I have here premium. And in premium, I can now select here Fabric capacity. So let me do so. And I can choose now between the running capacities. I go and choose the Fabric playground and hit apply. They change and we're good to go. One important thing to note is if I have a capacity like I did in Switzerland North and I create a second capacity, let's go with West Europe or any other region. If I wish to change the capacity or the workspace assigned to it, it's not going to work if the region is different. The reason and if you have fabric items deployed, that's important. If you have just Power BI, it's going to work. If you have fabric items like a lake house, a notebook, whatever, it's not going to work anymore because behind the scene, we have this one lake deployed into the specific region of this capacity. And if you choose now a different region, we do not move the data for you. You have to recreate your workspace uh, for this specific reason. Just that you know. All right. Once you've done that, uh, once you, 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 you're ready, you can use already fabric, you can create all these items and so on. And as mentioned, the fabric metrics app is important to understand how much has been used. And to get it, you can go to apps. You can go to get apps at the top. And from here, you just search for Microsoft Fabric, and you will see the Microsoft Fabric Capacity Metrics app. You can select it. And if you haven't get it, there will be a button to say get it. Okay, there we are. It says get it now. Not going to click it because I already installed it. This will take as well a minute, probably a two. And what will happen is you will see that the app has been installed with a timestamp, meaning this is the um, Last time Microsoft updated the app at the end. On top, we will also have workspace, as you see, with the same name. And in the workspace itself, I can also go and check out the semantic model and check out the report. We have uh, one question, uh, Christian. Yes. Uh, Dominic is uh, asking Is there a way to test without being charged right away? No, <laughs> no, only the fabric trial. <laughs> No, no, it is, it is. Um, we have a trial. Uh, I activated it. You see that I have trial 59 days left, meaning if I go to my user, usually you can see here uh, try paid features or something like this. It's a button which you can activate, and then you have 59 days to try out Fabric. Behind the scene, you will have an F64, which you can try out. But as mentioned, Copilot does not work on trial capacities. Okay, if you don't see this button, the reason is there is a setting in the admin portal and it could be 
that your uh, that your admin disallowed it. Um, paid feature. Give me a second. There it is. This is the setting which has to be enabled. It uh, which says users can try Microsoft Fabric paid features. If it's disabled, you cannot activate trials. That's what it does at the end. Hope that answers the question. All right. Going back to my capacity report. Um, let me reset everything. <clears throat> Once you open it for the first time, um, you will need to select a capacity. And to select it, this is a drop down for it, and you will see not only fabric capacities, you will also see other like a premium and like the embedded one and so on. And once you go and select something, let me go with the playground over here. Oh, let me take the load testing. Yeah, load testing has some data. Uh, once you select it, you will see what I explained before. In my case, the load testing looks pretty good. I haven't overused it. There are some interactive operations, meaning indicating by the red line. And if I wish, I can select something. Now the explore button is available. I can select the explore button and I will drill through to it and see for this specific time point what kind of operations have happened. And I can do my analysis this case. Yes. Provisions. Yes. Or the capacity. Hmm? You can only see the ones you own. Yes, that's true. Very good. Thanks for that. Um, to be able to see here the capacities, that's a good input from Rene. You need to have the sufficient permission, meaning admin of the capacity. Otherwise, you won't see it. We have one more question. Why is the rating of the Fabric app so low? Um, official Microsoft answer or? <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I must admit, I'm also not super happy with it because there are some things that um, probably confusing or not so nice. Um, I guess this is the reason, but it's important to really raise feedback or product group reads it and tries to improve it. And from what I see is that the old version was even worse. <laughs> it had like two stars and now this one has three stars, so we're improving. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's I agree it's not the best, but um, yeah, at least we have something which is OK, let's say. I think it's just not self-explanatory. You have to yes. dig in to understand, and I think that's the reason why it doesn't have a good rating, but I can also just guess. Yeah, and I mean that the topic itself, uh, must admit, it's not that easy. I mean, I discussed with Mario and Rene half a day long to really understand the bits and bytes of it, and now we took one hour to explain it, so I get that it's not that simple, yes. And we have one question from Andreas. Yes, hello everybody. Um, I work in a big finance company here in Switzerland and I have a question regarding the this, this metrics report. Um, when I have set up multiple uh, workspaces, is it useful to uh, use that report to, to build my internal customers with oh. that report? I love that question. I love it because this is a hot topic and I'm not surprised that it's coming from a finance guy <laughs> or five. Um, Yes, um, you can charge back, but right now it's um, it's not something very intuitive or super easy to set up. First, uh, and almost important, the Fabric Metrics app shows you only the last 14 days data. So meaning if you wish to charge back on a monthly base, you can do that, but not out of the box, meaning you cannot just go to the app, extract the or, or export the data and you're good because it only shows the last 14 days and you see that here as well. So what can you do? Two workarounds that we are working on right now is first, you can use the REST API to execute DAX statements against the semantic model and extract, for example, on a daily base, the data and store it for example, in one leg or in a database or wherever you wish, but you will need to set up a process to extract those data on your own. And one way is this, as mentioned, the REST APIs, or the other way would be to use semantic link. 
So within notebooks of Fabric, we have something called semantic link. Uh, it's an easy way to connect to your semantic model and extract the data as well. Nevertheless, the approach is the same. You would need to extract the information and store it on your own. Once stored, on top you can create an a chargeback. And what um, what kind of data we have is let me show that <clears throat> on every on every operation we do, you will see always the workspace name, the item, as well as the item name. On top, you will see which user has executed it. And this way you can map either to the admin of the workspace or to the specific user who executed it and charge back internally to the department, organization, whatever. Okay, clear. Uh, what of the what is the most common way for for the both uh, variants that you recommend? I see generally three approaches, and I must admit that the one that I just explained is the most fair chargeback mechanism. It's the most, let's say, complicated one to or the most time intensive to to set up, but it would be the most fair one, because if you set it up by consumption users will be interested to optimize their workload. Yeah. Uh, an alternative could be that you just go and say, OK, per user, you pay a certain amount of dollars, francs, whatever. But in this case, it's not fair because one user ca can have just one report and he will pay the same as another user who has 100 reports as well. And it, it and therefore it, the one with the 100 reports will obviously produce more load and capacity, sure. but will pay the same. So it's not so fair. Another approach could be that you say you you charge back by item. So for example, a Power BI report costs you one dollar, a data warehouse costs you two dollars, whatever. But still, it's not that fair because one report one small report will be charged the same as one big report even if the big report will produce more load and that's the reason why i think the chargeback on load is the fairest one and it will also force users to optimize their items make sense thank you christian thank you very much any further questions Right, doesn't look like so. From a fabric metrics app, this was it. I don't have any anything else uh, to be to be to be presented. Hope it was clear. Hope it was useful and interesting. And uh, for further resources, you see we have the blocks and so on to check it out. As a reminder, the next user group will happen um, on the fourth of April. As usual, uh, from 4 to 6 p.m., so the first, thurs, uh, first Thursday of the month. Next time it will be online. Um, Dennis will host the next session as I will not be available. And we will have Jay who will talk a uh, deep dive of the visual calculation in Power BI. So looking forward to it. Uh, what else we can do in there? And with that, thank you very much for attending, being online or in person. And yeah, we have still a few more minutes left. So if you have any further questions, feel free to drop them. Otherwise, I will close the call in a, in a minute or two. Thanks. Questions, anything? <laughs> yes, Mohamed. No, sorry. I would like to say thank you. <laughs> sorry. Very welcome. So, so sorry. <laughs> Everything good. Yeah. Doesn't look like we have any questions. With that, let me stop the recording and sharing. Suck. Suck. Uh,